To what does Calza aspire? To what does God aspire? In this concluding session, Colonel Park reminds us of the ideals of America's founding fathers. He speaks to us of Ben Franklin, Samuel Adams, George Washington. What they sought, we must seek. I believe that you will find this concluding session particularly uplifting. Causa proposes changes. The, I do not want you to misunderstand. Since we are so hard on communism, Maybe Kausa is trying to protect the status quo. Not true. We're not here to maintaining the status quo. We are the ones who believe change must come in our world. But Kausa proposes fundamental changes, not expedient, not just the convenience, fundamental change. That kind of change must come from cause, not as communism thinks, come from the effect. The cause, the change, when we say cause, we're talking about internal men. When the, the basic and the fundamental change come from internal men, That'll bring the change in system, in society, nation, and world. Kausa believed the human alienation occurred at the outset of human history. This is one thing we agree with Marxism. Karl Marx thought human alienation occurred. The Kausa believes Human alienation occurred. This is the one thing we agree. But that's all. Therefore, the solution is needed. The solution is not status quo. But we diagnose it. The human alienation is in terms of spiritual alienation, not economic, not by the laws of economics. Therefore, we propose it. Solution must be spiritual. Come from the value awakening. The spiritual alienation is primarily come because of the separation from God, men's separation from God. The solution must be, therefore, the union with God and his moral principle. Where must it begin? Goal is spiritual awakening and new moral value. Today, more than anything else we, this world need, in a free world need today, is this spiritual awakening or value awakening. We must be awakening to new value. That it must be spiritual value. This is our goal of Kausa movement. Where it come from? It must come from truth. So, Kausa begin with new truth. The new truth, however, is somewhat uh, or disturbing or a little bit contradictory or whatever. You might say, I agree with you if you say so. There really no such a thing, new truth. God is truth. God is God. There's no such thing new God. I have to explain why we say new truth. When we say new truth, we're talking about new expression of truth. For example, time of Abraham is a very primitive stage of life, in a way, pre-dawn culture level primitive stage. The Abraham's time that the people has no perception of understanding intellectually about God. All they can understand about God is that something that men can fear. Fear. So when, when 
Abraham offer his son Isaac to God. And God pronounced, Abraham, stop the knife. Stop the knife. Then God said, Abraham, now I know you fear God. In those days, only way they can understand God by fear and offering. Offering. However, time of Moses. This is probably early culture. And after human culture is dawn. But still very, shall we say, infant culture. Young. Human culture has not been grown up yet. Very young culture. Infant culture. Therefore, the teaching of God has been on do not, do not. I call it do not religion. So when you look at the Ten Commandments, what do they say? Do not do something. Do not do something. Do not worship your idol. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not covet. So it's, uh, it's like a parent. When your child is one year old, two year old, three year old, mostly your commandment to your children are do not commandment. Don't go out. It's dangerous. Don't go out the street. Don't touch it. Or don't come here. But when man is growing up, become a teenager, you know, teenagers hate to hear from the parents say, you don't do this, don't do that. They rather want to hear do this, do that. Why don't you go out to play something? Why don't you go to church? Why don't you do this? They love that. So, time of Jesus, human culture growing up to a teenager level. So this time, God is teaching people what do religion. Do something about it. Do love God. Do love your neighbor. These are two basic teachings that Jesus brought. Do love God. Do love your neighbor. That was 2,000 years ago. For 2,000 years, human history and human culture has been elevated into maturity. This is the time maturity, technologically and spiritually. Technologically, we send the man to the moon. Our star is nearing to the mar. Today, then what? What kind of new kind of teaching or new expression might be expected? I should say, the one to come is to be, to be. Not just to do not, not just do, you become one. To be a son of God, to be a daughter of God, to be a saint, to be Christ-like man. Once you achieve that level, then you don't have to have any instruction. You automatically, everything you do is the will of God. So this we call it actualization of sainthood of men. This is the age, the sainthood. No matter what, it's so much bleak things going on in our world. But in our God's mind, in the human history, it dawning toward ultimate fulfillment of sainthood. Each one of us is destined to become a saint. This is what we're talking about, perfection of men, the temple of God, so that we live with the divinity, divine quality. What's wrong with that? Why not? After all, that's the way God created men. Why not we achieve that goal? And we come to that level, to aiming that as the achievable goal. So when I say new truth, we're talking about a new expression of truth. When you come to Kausa Seminar, yesterday, Mrs. Wilson in our, in our dinner table, she said to me, it's something new here. You know, I never thought about that particular subject that way. Now she was quite, uh, quite deeply thinking of certain things we express here, such as purpose of creation. I was so inspired to hear that comment. The reason was that if Kausa has nothing, no new quality or the new inspiration or new uh, excitement to engender, then we are not supposed to be here. Be everybody else doing already. There's a new quality and a new excitement that come because we have this new expression of truth. 
from this new expression of truth, there will be a spiritual awakening. This is what we're aiming, spiritual awakening. New truth, open our eyes, particularly spiritual understanding, which will bring priority, change in priority, uh, in value. Yesterday, Tom Word was talking. There's some confusion in priority of value. So we have to set the priority straight. We have to understand the value straight. For example, there's a value, basically two values, material value and a spiritual value. Material value is a temporal value. Spiritual value is permanent value. Material value is a temporary value. It won't last. And the other one is eternal value. And material value is a secondary, whereas spiritual value is primary. So here you can see Kausa. We do not deny the material value. On the contrary, we really have an importance of the material value we realize. But the spiritual value come for primary. Material value comes secondary. We have to set the priority straight. And then this will bring, ignite revolution of men. This is quite important subject to dwell. I wish I could have more time on this one, revolution of men. Let me first invite your attention to, once again, men, worst enemy. At outset of worldview, cause worldview, I said, the worst enemy of God and men is communism. That is, in a way, external enemy. Here we are talking about internal enemy. Internal enemy of men is selfishness. This is the worst enemy. Therefore, we're talking about a quiet revolution, but intense. Quiet means we don't need a bullet, we don't need a rifle. But individuals begin this intense inspiration, I mean, uh, revolution. From selfishness to unselfishness. This is the goal. This is the revolutionary goal, internal goal. Unless we achieve this goal within ourselves, do not even talk about achieving goal to, you know, finishing up communism externally. This is what the Khausa approach is different. We're not just criticizing communism. Ultimately, we're finger pointing at not only communism, we finger point at ourselves, myself. You know, to win communism, I am the one to change. This is the approach. Let me talk about a little bit more about um, selfishness. Man has desire to better himself. Is this selfishness? Man has ambition to secure his well-being. Is that selfishness? Man has drive to achieve his higher values. Is that selfishness? Answer is no. All these are God-given qualities. Nothing wrong with that. Desire. Ambition, drive, is a God-given original nature of men. Therefore, not evil at all, not sinful at all. This we don't call it selfishness. What is then selfishness? Selfishness is the narrow application of men's desire or ambition. The blinded application. It will engender greed, jealousy, vanity. Those are the poison to spiritual life of men. Selfishness is a perverted nature of men. It comes from the blindness of spiritual reality. Since we do not aware higher values and blinded about the spiritual reality, the, our desire and ambition apply narrowly that turn out to be a selfish. So there are two realities. One is material reality. The other is spiritual reality. And these two realities are existing together. Selfishness comes when 
people do not see the spiritual reality, only focus on material reality. This is where selfishness comes. Selfishness can be compared to a drug. Drug. Many young people are victim of drug. Why they become a victim? Why they go after drug? Because they're searching after artificial high. They want to be high. They want to on trip. They want to feel fun, feel heaven, but artificially. By doing so in process, they are making themselves permanently damaged to their health. That's what the drug does. Selfishness, by the same token, it focused on material well-being or vanity or vaingloriousness. This is like um, street searching at artificial high. But in process, one is making a permanent damage to eternal life. Unselfishness, however, does not mean giving up all the material value. We're not saying here that you give up your material value. Not at all. It does mean to use all material means to attain spiritual satisfaction. The material, the value you have, you cannot take it with you. Might as well use it for your best advantage while you are here on earth. This is wise men and women to do. See, our ultimate benefit would be attainment of the spiritual satisfaction. That will retain with us. That will go with me all the, all, all the way. So, our material strength, whatever I have, use maxim as instrument, as a mean, as a weapon to enrich my spiritual life, our spiritual life, and the spiritual life of our world incredibly wonderful wise investment we're talking about here in the revolution of men new man and woman new man and new woman as much as communism talking about regeneration of men we here talk about new man new woman that does not mean we go back to mother's womb come out again impossible but when you have a new spiritually awakened to higher values you are a new man when you have a new motivation, you are a new man. And uh, when new goal in life, new vitality and enthusiasm, if these qualities are true within you, inspire you, indeed you are new men and women. When this kind of revolution of man internally taking place. Solution to communism is automatic. You already solved the communistic problem because there's no room for communism anymore. Communism has no appeal to you. Instead, you are the one who can go after communism, have a power and a compassionate power to go over them, liberate them. You can talk communism. You know, yesterday you have a movie You've seen the movie, and the man, before I met Kausa, I was a Marxist. But it changed, because this Kausa worldview has a power to change and make them realize Marxism is wrong. This is a kind of power we're talking about. This is kind of solution to communism we're talking about. But we are not stopping here. We move on to ideal society. Ideal society, as I said, ultimate realization of human dream. That means realization of utopia. What we are, human history, ultimately going toward the society of saints. Don't you like it? That's it. That's the way God intended to. First place. This is why this is an attainable goal. It's already in the blueprint. The men are building it. Even Arnold Toynbee, 
mentioned in the study of history, that toward the sainthood, the humanity is marching toward the sainthood. When you really know God, when you really have God, that that is our goal, nothing else. Attainment of the sainthood. I know uh, my time is up. I would like to the beg your understanding, give me just 10 more minutes, let me finish this. I want to summarize Godism and communism. Godism is coming up and change in men, proposes. Communism, change in system. Godism proposes internal revolution of heart or mind or love or revolution of men. Communism proposes external revolution with violence. Godism is bringing solution at root, whereas communism is bringing solution at symptom. We focus on individual. This is where the deviation began. Therefore, this is where the restoration must begin. Individual is the building block of the family, society, nation, and world. This is the root, this is the ground floor. That if you really, the meaningful change you want to bring about in our world that must begin from individual level. That means it must begin from me, right here. This is the beginning point. Godism and communism the God and no God. One has eternal life, the other is temporal life. One has absolute value, the other is relative value. One has a cooperation, the other dialectic. Hatred. History is struggle between good and evil. They propose history as a class struggle. Between the two, one must be a lie, one must be truth. Both cannot be true. But the truth or lie, false or truth or false, is determined by on one fact. There's God or no God. Is God yes? No God no? Then you know it. Communism is a lie and Godism is truth. It's my final conclusion. The five points of cultural worldview upon which I feel that all of us can unite, all the religious people can unite. This is the time for you to examine whether you can accept this five point. This is broad enough to unite all God accepting people and people of conscience. At the same time, specific enough to throw out all communist ideas. Any good communist, if they already accept 105, I'm going to point out, he would not be a communist anymore. So you see, this is, this is a beautiful way we can weed out, you know, throw out all the communistic ideas. At the same time, broad enough to bring in all God-accepting people to the unity. So this is very exciting, final conclusion. Now, I'd like to you to follow this five point with me. One, God is the creator. Two, man is the child of God. Three, man is created free so that he can love and take responsibility. It's already saying history is running on the providence. But the important would be that men given a free will to love freely and to take a responsibility. God has given men to choose his own destiny. Four, man lives an eternal life. Five, selfless love is the supreme value. These are the five. Is any one of those that any communist can accept? He's no longer a communist. Number one, for example, he accepted God is a creator. He's no longer Marxist. 
even five. Self is love, is a supreme value. The Marxists accept this five. He is no longer a communist. He can know such a thing love in Marxism. At this point, I would like to very quickly bring your attention. I would do this only to the American audience. Also, this has been newly added ever since I met Dr. Clarence Skousen and read the book, The 5,000 Year Leap. And this book is available outside after this lecture. If you are interested in, please pick up the copy. 5,000 Year Leap. This book is basically saying America, in a short 200 years of history, have a 5,000 year leap because there's a right concept of government, right ideology, right founding father thinking. So let me review their thinking just a minute. I think you'll be interested. The founding fathers thought the religion is the found foundation of morality and essential to good government. In 1787, the US Constitution approved by Congress. At the same time, that same year, Northwest Ordinance, so-called the Northwest Ordinance, also passed. That Northwest Ordinance, Article 3, it said, religion, morality, and knowledge is being necessary to good government and happiness of mankind. The schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. The moral education, formal education, was to include the three teaching and the three points. One, religion. Two, morality. Three, knowledge. This was a founding father thought. These are the three elements for education. Today, our education system is primarily in trouble because we do not follow the Founding Father's advice. We teach no religion. We teach no morality. We only teach knowledge. This is the problem of our school system. Founding Father knew. But the key question you may ask, the Founding Father's asking to teach religion. What religion? The founders of America set out to exclude the creeds and biases or dissensions of individual denomination so as to make the teaching of religion a unifying cultural adhesive rather than divisive apparatus. They worry about this, I think most rightfully. Religion should not be denominational battle or theological debate. There must be unifying, somehow unifying Adhesive. Now, what they're seeking actually, universal religions, the principle common to all faith. Common to all faith. Among the founding fathers thought, Benjamin Franklin summarized that very well, summarized it. And he wrote this. Here is my creed as a universal religion. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe that he governs it by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service we render to him is in doing good to his other children, that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life, respecting his conduct in this. These I take to be the fundamental points in all sound religion, from which we come up with the five fundamental of a sound religion all come from Dr. Scowenson's book. Those five points are, one, there's one God, the creator of the universe. He ought to be worshipped. Two, he governs the world by his providence. Three, men can glorify God by loving his children. Four, the soul of man is immortal. Five, in the next life, the soul of man is judged by his conduct in this world. The Samuel Adam, I was really come to respect your founding fathers more after reading this book. Look at what the Samuel Adam said. This group of basic beliefs which constitute the religion of America is the religion of all mankind. At that time, two, three hundred years ago, 
They were already thinking religion of mankind, not just focus on America. They're worrying about the world, unifying the world at that time. I really pay my respect to this kind of thinking. Now, the view of founding fathers and cause the world view. Let us compare. One, there's one God, the creator, he ought to be worshipped. Cause the world view said, God is the creator. We omitted, he ought to be worshipped. Because as I said, this is not the religious movement. I would like to have a worshiping part to your ministers, to your church, to your church organization. Two, man can glorify God by loving his children. We say man is the child of God. Very basic. Three, he governs the world by his providence. We say we not only understand that, but man is created free so that he can love and take responsibility. Four, the soul of man is immortal. We say man lives an eternal life. They said the soul of man is judged by his conduct in this world. We say selfless love is a supreme value. This will secure our eternal life. This will bring our good deeds in a, in a rewarded very handsomely. I want you to understand Carl's worldview was not structured after I read this book. Already Carl's worldview going for three years. Last several months I met this book. And when I compared the founding father's thinking with Carl's worldview, I was flabbergasted. I was totally, totally inspired. Now, thought of American founding fathers, the Carl's worldview, the Founding Fathers looking for universal religious principle. Here today, we are looking for universal ideological principle. Founding Fathers said, without religion, the government of a free people cannot be maintained. We say universal principle and ideological principle that provide common ground for unity. 300 years ago, American founding father thought was vital for America's survival. Today, in the 20th century, Carl's worldview is vital for free world survival. This is what it's up to. Let us conclude this whole Carl's worldview with a powerful statement by Victor Hugo. More powerful than an invading army is an idea whose time has come. Ladies and gentlemen, my final and a final and a final message to you is this. May God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention throughout the whole of this program. It has truly been a joy for the CASA staff to present this program to you. I believe that we can say with confidence that through this presentation, we have gained some understanding of Marxism, its fallacies, and also some insight into the causal response to Marxism, which we refer to as Godism. On behalf of the whole of the causal staff, I would like to say, may God bless you, your families, and may God bless America. Thank you for your kind attention.